This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. This morning, we started to look at the 2018 exam paper. And in the morning, we looked at question one. We found the uh, equilibrium, we linearized the system, and then we drew the block diagram, right? So, to, well, this afternoon, we'll be looking at um, question three and four in the 2018 exam, all right? So question three, it's a question on root locus. Question four, it's on Nyquist. So those are some important knowledge that you need to master to finish your exam, right? So um, let's start with question three. So in question three, um, you have your Planck transfer function like this. The first question is asking you um, to plot, uh, sketch your root locus, assuming that you have a proportional controller to control this plot, right? So when you start to look at your uh, root locus, you firstly, so there's <coughs> question three, A. You firstly write down your poles and zeros, right? So your poles are zero, <coughs> plus one, and negative one, right? And the zeros you have are negative four and negative two, <coughs> right? So now you draw your root locus and label the poles and your zeros. Right? So this is at negative four, negative two, negative one, zero and one. Right? And when you are drawing root locus, you know that um, there are some parts along the real axis. Well, this is real axis, right? There are some parts along the real axis that belongs to your root locus, right? Where are those segments? How do you determine which part belongs to the root locus along the real axis? So if you have odd number of poles or zeros on the uh, sorry on the right hand side, then you know that segment belongs to your root locus, right? So here, firstly, this segment has only one pole on the right hand side, right? So this segment belongs to your root locus, right? And also this one, because it has three poles on the right-hand side, right? 
So this is also part of your rule locus. And here as well, right? Because you have one, two, three, four, five, five poles or zeros on your right hand side, right? So you know that um, as k increases, you are traveling from your open loop poles to your open loop zeros, right? So which means this is already fine, right? You just travel from here to there, right? These are two poles which meet together and needs to go to somewhere, right? Here's a zero you have something coming in, right? And you know that the relative degree is one. So you have one zero at infinity, right? And the phase is uh, pi, right? So you can calculate this based on the formula uh, which is shown in your lecture slides, right? So you have another zero which is far away along this line, right? So that gives you your root locus should look something like this. So they meet up together, split, meet again, one comes here, the other goes to that way. Right? This two line should be, uh, this two curves should be um, symmetric. So this is your root locus. Is everyone following this? Um, well, you can, if you have time, you can calculate those numbers and indicate that on your sketch. But if you don't have time, you can just um, sketch a shape of your root locus. But as you progress in question B, you find that you actually need to calculate that point. <laughs> yeah. So it's the same. Um, so let's move on to question B. Question B. So question B is asking, so using the root locus you just constructed in question A, determine the minimum value of K for which the closed loop system poles are all real and stable. So if you want all your poles to be real, they cannot be along these two curves, right? So this one you know is definitely real and stable, right? For these two, as they meet together, well, this is on the right half, right half plane, so this is unstable, right? As soon as they meet, they will sl split, right? They'll travel along these two curves until they meet again, right? So all these parts are not valid. Right? So you are looking for the point where they meet together and that meetup point is uh, stable, which means on the left half plane. So you are actually looking for this point. Right? So this is, well, the K corresponds to this point is the minimum value that can give you, um, like all poles, all closed loop poles are real and stable, right? So now we need to calculate the K for this point. Before we do that, we need to calculate the value of this point, right? Because you know that uh, once you write up your characteristic polynomial, um, like along the root locus, it's always equal to zero, right? So if you have your pole identified, if you have this point identified, you can calculate the, the gain uh, based on that equation, right? 
So firstly, we write down the characteristic polynomial. So this is a plant. You have a proportional controller together with it. So um, your open loop transfer function is actually k times g not s, which is k times s plus 4 times s plus 2 uh, over s times s squared minus 1. Right? So this is your open loop transfer function. Right? So your characteristic polynomial will be s times s squared minus 1 plus k times s plus 4 times s plus 2. Right? Okay. So you uh, open it up. s cubed minus s plus k s squared plus um, 6ks plus 8k, right? You organize the terms, you have right? So this is your characteristic polynomial right, with a proportional controller. And now, in order to find this point, um, well, the first equation you can write down is that, well, you know on your root locus, you always have, well, um, let's say, um, let's say this point, let's label it as, um, Right? Just a random letter. So you know that at P, lambda P equals to zero because this point belongs to your root locus. Right? And also, you know that at this point, you have two repeated poles. Right? So the two poles meet together at this point, then split, right? So you have two repeated poles at this point, right? And when you have two repeated poles, you also have the derivative of your characteristic polynomial equals to zero, right? Because it's repeated. So um, imagine you are having a curve. You are finding the root of the curve. So imagine you have some random curve. Your root for the curve, if this is zero, then these are the roots, right? So we have repeated root. You are basically having for example, something like this. Let me just barely touch it, right? So at this condition, you have your derivative equals to zero, right? So when you have repeated poles, you have the derivative of with respect to S, right? So the derivative of your characteristic polynomial also equal to zero, right? So now you can so you can write it down. You know that your um, char characteristic polynomial looks like this. So you can write it down as p cubed plus k p squared plus 6k minus 1p plus 8k equals to 0. And that, that corresponds to the first one, right? So for this one, 
it's 3p squared plus 2kp plus 6k minus 1 equals to 0. Right? This is your characteristic polynomial equals to 0. This is um, the derivative equals to 0. Right? So with this two, um, so I'll just label it as one, label that as two. So from one, actually two would be easier. So from two, you can organize the terms that contains k, put it on the left-hand side, and the rest on the right hand side. Right? And you have the relationship between K and P. Right? And we label this as 3. Now you can just substitute 3 back into 1. That gives you p cube plus k is this and um, squared plus so um, take it out it's p times six minus p plus 8 times this. Right. You multiply both sides by 2p plus 6, then you get Open up the brackets, you have All right. That's that. This is this. This is this. This is that. That's that. And now you organize the terms, so p to the power of 4, so you have this 2, to negative p to the power of 4, and then cube, that's negative 12 p is, uh, cube, and then squared, and that gives you negative 25 p squared. Um, this two cancels out, and then you have positive eight, right? So by solving this, you can find the values of p, right? So I know it's really difficult to solve by hand. So if by any chance that you have something similar in exams, um, you can just, by trial and error, do a numerical estimation with your calculator, right? Or if you are short of time, you can just leave it there, say, uh, we solve this polynomial, we find the P, and then based on the P, we can find the K, right? So, if you solve this, if you solve this, you can find one of the solutions on P, which corresponds to this point, gives you p is roughly negative 9.33. Okay. 
So you can, uh, well, if you really need to solve this kind of thing in exam, you take out your calculator. Uh, well, you, well, you, you first sub in maybe one and find that it's uh, like negative, what's that, 30. And so it's not close to zero and you sub in a larger number and eventually, well, you know that it's below uh, point, sorry, negative four, right? So you can just sub in, um, say, negative five, negative six. But I mean, if you really have this, you can explain the procedure. Well, we are testing your understanding, not your calculation, right? So if you really have something that's really difficult to calculate, you can always explain how you're gonna proceed to reach to the answer, right? If you don't have time to uh, finish your calculation, all right? So, but if you do have time, if you are uh, confident with the material, you can finish your exam like in a short time, and then you have time to go through all the calculations, and then you can, by trial and error, you find this value, right? So, um, anyway, you can find your P equal to, like, roughly, negative 9.33 and based on this value using this relationship you can then find the k value at this point is roughly 20.55 all right so that is for question B. So, so basically 20.55 is the minimum value of K so that all your closed loop poles are real and stable. Right? Okay. So let's move on to C. So C is saying using your root locus, um, discuss in detail what effect an increase in K has on the overshoot, rest time, and cycling time of a stepper, so on and so forth. Um, so if you remember, you do have this, right? That's taken from your lecture slides, right? So it's an open book exam, you can take whatever material you like, so of course you can bring this, right? So, now you check your root locus. As K increases, <coughs> these two poles meet together and split, and meet together and split. This one just travels along to here, right? So S, well, I'll just write it here, right? C, as K increases, firstly, your overshoot, right? How does that change? Overshoot is here. Did I hear increases? So as K increases, well, it makes no sense to look at the unstable part, right? So you just focus on the stable part. So as K increases, how does your overshoot change? Well, firstly, firstly, how does this angle change? As K increases, as K increases, your angle, this angle is getting larger, right? Right? So this is the pivot. You're rotating like this, right? Until a point, a reach to your real axis, right? 
So as your k increases, this angle keep increasing, right? As it keep increasing, you can find that um, as as your c increases, your overshoot decreases, right? So as the overshoot, sorry. As K increases, your overshoot decreases. Right? And next, rise time. Rise time is here. Right? How does that change? First decrease, then increase. Why did you get increase? Because um, when the liquid starts with predominant force, it's close to the original. But you have this bit here. Right? So as your K grows, like this, this um, semicircle gets larger and larger, right? So um, start from here, it gets larger and larger and larger and larger and larger, right? But it won't get past this point. But that is at k equals to infinity, right? So as your k increases, your your rise time, well, your omega n, well, actually, your omega n actually increases, right? And hence, your rise time decreases, right? Okay. And the next one will be setting time. Time over here. So as your k increases, how does your setting time change? It's kind of similar, right? So as your k increases, this line keep moving to the left hand side, right? Right? Until this point. But again, that is when k is at infinity, right? So we know that when k increases, as k increases, your sigma increases, right? And that corresponds to a decreasing setting time. Right? <coughs> this you the part. Yes, you are looking at the stable part. So if it's unstable, it makes no sense to discuss overshoot um, setting time, rest time, right? Okay, so that's for question three. Look at question four, which is a night crease question. Right? Okay. So in question four, uh, I probably don't need this. Um, it's saying you have a open loop transfer function of a system given by this. The night crease plot of this transfer function is given in figure three. Three. A zoomed in plot. Well, notice that you have a really large magnitude here. Right? So this is a really zoomed out version. So a zoomed in version is given in figure four, 
which is like this. So this is really just this bit. And the first question is saying, well, now you need to complete your Nyquist plot by determining the shape at infinity. You have infinity because you are having poles on your imaginary axis, right? So if you still remember um, we were doing Nyquist, there is a D contour, right? So in Nyquist, you are converting that, you are transforming that D contour onto um, this complex plane using the transfer function, right? And that, that can indicate the stability of your system, right? So now in this case, you still have your D contour, but and this rule, this is... But along the imaginary axis, you have poles, right? So with this, you have your pole at plus, ni uh, plus and minus j, right? So this is j, this is negative j, right? So now your d contour now your D contour looks like this, right? And you can say the radius is epsilon, which is a really, really small number, right? So, Firstly, um, <coughs> with this transfer function, we can determine, um, you know, on the Nyquist plot, you can determine your uh, zero plus, zero minus, plus infinity and negative infinity points, right? So you have your um, lambda not s equals two, s minus 0.5 over s squared plus one. So you write it in j omega, which gives you, this will just be negative omega squared plus one, right? So from here, you know that as omega tends to zero, so if omega is zero, you have negative 0.5, right? So your omega not j omega, sorry, uh, lambda not j omega equals to negative 0.5, which means you have a magnitude of 0.5 and phase of um, 180, right? So from the plot, you know that it's here, right? And if it's, if it's zero plus, if it's zero plus, you know that you have some positive value on J, so it's slightly pointing up. So above this line, you have your zero plus, below this, you have your zero minus, right? And as omega tends to um, positive infinity, so if it's positive infinity, you get um, this as, an, as a, a really large, this whole part, as a really large negative value. And here um, you have a really large magnitude on imaginary axis, right? So which means your magnitude, as this is really large, like it's squared, so it, it actually dominates, so the magnitude um, is zero, and the phase um, well, actually, I should I should put zero here. Let's 
So this is a really large negative value. So you can put the negative sign to the numerator, which becomes 0.5 minus j omega, right? And hence, because omega is really big, so your phase would be just um, negative 90 degrees, right? So which means your omega at uh, positive infinity is corresponding to here, right? And if you do a similar thing, you just uh, swap the sign and then you get omega tend to negative infinity. Well, the magnitude is the same. The phase will just be um, flipped, which is 90 degrees, right? So you have here, sorry, this is plus. So your negative infinity is here, right? So that's something you can label on your, on your plot. Other than that, you need to find what's happening with the imaginary poles, right? So with that part, um, we can write this part of the contour as um, as equals to well for for this bit we'll I will just um, take this one as an example this one is similar so you can just identify one and then the other well you know your Nyquist diagram is kind of mirrored um, with respect to the real axis so when you get one immediately you know the other, right? So take this as an example. Um, so in this case, your S is J plus epsilon e to the J theta. Theta is this angle, right? So you can put this in the, um, in the lambda naught. So lambda naught, j plus epsilon e j theta. That gives you, well, remember your epsilon is a really, really small number, right? <coughs> so if you put that in, you have j plus epsilon e j theta minus 0.5 over this squared plus one, right? That gives you so this squared is negative one plus this squared is uh, epsilon squared e to j theta plus two times plus one. And this and that cancels out. You have, and and you can write it in oops, in this form. So S, epsilon, it's a really, really small number. You can ignore this term, right? Because it's really, really small, right? You can also ignore this, right? So you can ignore this one and that one. That gives you two J times this, right? You move your J uh, to your numerator by multiplying J on uh, both numerator and denominator. Then you get um, you multiply here, we'll get negative one, so you just put it on top. So it's like 0.5j minus one 
and you have that over right that really just gives you Sorry, you don't have this. Right? So now you can write that the face of your lambda naught j plus epsilon e j theta is just the sum of these terms. This term plus this term plus this term, right? So now we can write down the table. Um, so as theta change from um, negative pi on two to zero to pi on two, so theta from negative pi on two to zero to pi on two. Yep. Um, when you said j minus 0.5, and then you said 0.5 j minus one. Yeah, so you multiply j on both your numerator and denominator. Divided by j, <coughs> j divided by j is one. I just get negative one. So you are, you are actually uh, multiplying well so basically I prefer to multiply it so if you multiply a j here it will be j times j is negative 1 right so this becomes negative 2 uh, epsilon e j theta and here you get negative 1 you get uh, negative four. Oh, I made a mistake yeah, that's plus. Sorry. Yes, you're right. That's plus. Yep. So we continue with this. <coughs> yep. So theta uh, from negative pi on two to zero to pi on two, right? So when it's at negative pi on two, well, you know that this is just zero, right? This is a positive real number, right? Right? This is, um, arc 10 of 0.5 over one. Right? And this is just negative theta. Right? You know that this value is a small uh, degree. So if you really want to calculate that, do we have, do we have that? Uh, I didn't calculate that. It's roughly 10 degrees or something like that. I can't remember. So it's a, it's a small positive angle, right? So when you have pi, sorry, when you have theta equals to negative pi on two, then this angle will be pi on two plus, so if you, if you write this as alpha, so it will be just pi on two plus alpha, right? Okay, fine. That's okay. I mean, it's a, it's a positive degree, which is not larger than 90 degrees, right? So, um, when it's at zero, you have just alpha, right? When it's at pi on two, 
we have negative pi on 2 plus alpha, right? So coming back to this, this diagram. So pi on 2 plus alpha, which corresponds to this line, right? Note that the scale is different. Right? You have different scales on your x and y axis, right? So this is this looks like 45 degrees. I mean, from here to there, looks like 45 degrees, but it is actually not, right? So this is actually alpha. So you have pi on 2 plus alpha, 2 alpha, which is somewhere here, and then to negative pi on 2 plus alpha, which is this line, right? So you know that you are from you're traveling from here to there and then to here, right? So now you can connect this line like this, right? I'm traveling in this direction, right? <coughs> And similarly, well, this is for omega um, greater than zero. And for omega smaller than zero, you just mirror the image, right? And well, if you're not sure about that, you can also go through the same calculation. Instead of having positive j here, you have negative j here, right? Then you do the same analysis and you find that it is something like this, right? So this is coming out, this is traveling this way, this is traveling in, right? So that completes your Nyquist plot. Um, because like you need to travel from zero minus to zero plus, from zero plus to positive infinity, from positive infinity to negative infinity, from negative infinity to zero minus, right? Yeah, why don't you go from top right to top left to bottom left? Or the other way around. That way? Uh, you know your Nyquist plot is always uh, symmetric with respect to your real axis. Always. Like, um, so if you write your S as a, uh, a real value plus a uh, imaginary term, imaginary part so for example a plus b j then when your omega is is uh, inverted in sign you basically is taking uh, the negative of that face right so you put a negative one multiply a negative one on the face right so if you have positive this much degrees, then when you have a negative omega, you are here. So it's always symmetric with respect to your real axis, right? All right, so that's your plot. You've already completed the um, Nyquist plot. Um, so the second question is saying, using the Nyquist criterion, verify the st stability of the closed loop system whose open loop transfer function is given here. And if stable, estimate phase and gain margins and annotate um, the lines that are used, right? So from open loop transfer function, we know that we don't have any unstable pole, right? Right? So we have we have p equals to zero, right? And from your Nyquist plot with a zoomed inversion, 
you know that we don't have any circlements with respect to your um, critical point, right? So your critical point sits to the left hand side of the curve, right? So your n is zero, right? That gives you your z equals to n plus p is also zero, which means stable, right? Now we have it stable, we need to estimate gain and phase margin, right? So gain margin is very straightforward. Um, you have the zoom in plot. You know that this is the closest point to your critical point. You know it's at negative 0.5. So you know that you know that your um, gain margin is just uh, one on 0.5, right? This is 0.5, right? So which is two. And you write it in decibel, which gives you roughly 6.02 dB, right? Now phase margin. So your phase margin, well, this, is, this scale is kind of weird. So if you draw a unit circle, you have something like This is your unit circle, kind of compressed, right? We read our phase margin out from here, right? So something you need to be careful here is that, well, the reason I, I, I point out this, these features here is that this one corresponds to your omega greater than zero curve, right? This one is your omega smaller than zero curve. So you always look for the curve that represents omega greater than zero, right? So in this case, you need to look at this point. And by estimating the magnitude, um, you roughly say, well, this and this looks similar. So you can say that this is roughly negative 45 degrees, right? So you're you always saying how much you rotate clockwise, right? So this is kind of counterclockwise. So you put a negative sign there, right? So your phase margin is roughly negative 45 degrees, right? And lastly, um, is saying, suppose you have, in, uh, you introduce a controller gain, K, which can be any value, so that your open loop transfer function becomes this, so just with a K, and using a Nyquist criterion, determine all values of K for which your closed loop system is stable. So apparently, um, when your K is greater than zero, you are scaling you're just scaling this figure, right? So if you have k greater than zero, you can have stability, but it cannot go beyond two, which is your gain margin. So once it goes beyond two, you have encirclements uh, with respect to your critical point, and then your n will no longer be zero, right? And hence, your system, your closed loop system will be unstable, right? So, you have the range of k smaller than two, but greater than zero. But this range also gives you flexibility to explore k is negative, right? So what happens when k is negative? You have a you have a gain which kind of um, like scale your plot, but with a negative real value, 
you're also adding a phase of pi, right? So what it's doing is that you are rotating your plot 180 degrees, right? So as you can see, as soon as you rotate a